Cannes Fusion so, 2016. Google. Now, the other thing is that, you know, in a, in a room like this, um, I feel like I have to establish my geek credentials. Uh, but um, yeah. I'm not going to be exactly yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not going to be able to do it with um, with my you know extensive knowledge of science fiction, which is non-existent. So instead, I want to do it by showing you a graph. <laughs> so it's with geeky stuff, right? So this bottom line in particular is the rate of poverty in the United States uh, in the since about 1940 until 1970 or so. It was a, there was a very consistent decline. And then since then, it's basically been flat. There's been a little bit of an increase since the uh, most recent recession. Now, the interesting thing is that science fiction has a lot to say about problems of poverty and inequality and so on. And here is one such claim. So this is John Luc Picard from the movie First Contact. He says, the economics of the future, and by which the future he means the time that he's from, of the future are somewhat different. You see, money doesn't exist in the 24th century. Okay? The acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives. We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. Um, now, you know, those are, yeah, great, right? How are we gonna get there? How are we gonna get there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> scarcity or bust. Um, so, you know, the premise of Star Trek is that the reason why this happens is because the technology in the future is so great that everybody, there's abundant food, there's abundant energy, we have matter replicators everywhere, there's no reason to fight over this stuff because there's so much of it that, you know, peace reigns. Uh, there's love, there's happiness, um, and that's why I personally think in Star Trek there's so many alien species because without them it would be a really boring world. Right? <laughs> um, so I'm going to suggest that, uh, that this world, if it comes to be, is not going to be because of our technology. It's going to be because of something else, and that Thank something you. else has to happen. Thank you. Um, so, but before I go there, I'm going to say that on the one hand, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to talk about how technology is bad or how technology doesn't doesn't have any impact because it does in fact have quite an impact. Um, I'm sure probably all of you have little computers in your pockets uh, now. There you go. Um, and you know, these things have certainly transformed our lives, right? Uh, once upon a time, you know, in fact, uh, the internet really went mainstream when I was in graduate school. And I remember literally one year I had to go to the library on a weekly basis to go look up stuff. And then the next year, all of a sudden, I did not have to do that anymore because uh, I was in uh, the computer science. And the uh, library and in the office. And the li <laughs> <laughs> There's still good, re good reasons to go to the library. Um, and in fact, you know, much of our, uh, you know, our online resources, at least in the university, are still de you know, depending on the librarians curating them. Um, but uh, so these devices have definitely done something, right? But what I'm going to suggest in this uh, talk, and this is a topic of my book, is that what they've done is something, but it's not positive social change in and of itself. And, uh, and I want to suggest that we actually live in a world in which the dominant messaging, you know, interestingly enough, I find, you know, I've been here for a couple, a day and a half now, but I find that among science fiction fans, there's this deep understanding that the technology doesn't solve problems. But out there in the real world, strangely, people think technology solves all kinds of problems. So here's Mark Zuckerberg. He said, this is what he said, the richest 500 million people have way more money than the next 6 billion combined. You solve that by getting everyone online. And he speaks that as one of the richest 500 million. Yes, he does. He does, exactly. He's basically saying that internet is going to get rid of social, economic inequality. Yeah, right. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah, buy right. his stuff. Buy his stuff. Yeah, buy his right. stuff and then You don't need to buy it. Just use it. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, another claim that's made is that you know technology brings about democratization and world peace because it connects people and you know we have more empathy for each other, etc. Uh, Hillary Clinton in 2011 she announced a uh, American foreign policy of internet freedom where basically it was you know uh, founded on this idea that having access to information is the basis by which human beings hold their governments accountable. That's, yes. Yeah, I, I don't know if you're aware in Michigan uh, our governor just passed a bill which uh, prohibits feder uh, federally funded organizations from it disseminating information uh, about elections for the 60 days immediately prior to that election. Oh, that's so, so that, that affects libraries oh. and, sure, of course, absolutely. and and national radio. Uh, yeah. And so that's, yeah, yes, and absolutely. <laughs> but that's, I wanted to talk yes. about the information thing she's talking about here. This is not a new, a new thought. Right. You go to the Detroit Library. It says, "Knowledge is power." That's right. That's right. And and it's the same old, same old. It's the same old, same old. That's and actually and correct. And that's where people go who don't have like who have no computers. I mean, I'm getting the sense that I don't have. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to the choir. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll keep going. Well, I disagree with you. So. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is our.
Ronnie Duncan, he, he uh, actually, I'm not sure if he stepped down yet, but he's close to stepping down, but he is, yeah. I believe he's still our uh, Secretary of Education. And he says technology is a game changer in the field of education, a game changer we desperately need to both improve achievement for one increased equity. Right, so once again, equity just time in the context of education as well as improving education for everybody. Interestingly, in this speech, particular speech, he mentioned the word technology 45 times or so. He mentioned teachers only about 25 times. Right, so this is the direction. Alter technology and pray. That's right. <laughs> All right, so um, where I come from is I am actually a computer scientist by training. Uh, I did a PhD in computer science, and for a long time, I did research in an area of artificial intelligence called computer vision, which is how to get computers to understand imagery. Um, and I used to work at Microsoft. Uh, in 2004, I moved to... that again, shit. What's that? You won't hold that again. Yeah, thank you. In 2004, I moved to India to help start a new research lab for the company. And with that move, I also changed direction. So I used to do all these things which, you know, ultimately contributed to things like uh, Microsoft's Connect system, you know, which, like, watches how you move and you know, interprets your emotions as a way to control video game characters. And I wanted to have a different kind of impact. So when I moved to India, I started working on projects where the goal was to use digital technology in some way to help alleviate poverty. Um, now, India, of course, is a very interesting place. Uh, you know, this is our very fancy office, but we routinely had, like, domesticated cows, you know, walking across the street. Um, you know, this is a country with uh, 1.2 billion people, of which two-thirds of the country is still, you know, earns their income, their livelihood primarily through agriculture in some form or another. Um, and so, you know, one of the things, one of the areas that we worked in was, you know, how can we help farmers in various ways using digital technology. So this man is a man, he, uh, from uh, Pune, a, a village a few um, minutes outside of Pune, which is a, uh, a city close to Mumbai. Um, and uh, he's a sugarcane farmer. And we, at one point, started working with this sugarcane cooperative there, which interestingly had ins um, installed a system of computers in the villages that it worked with as a way to help the farmers get access to the internet. And this was done through a government grant, and the government wanted these villages to become more modern, and so they put the internet in these uh, kiosks, um, and they expected that farmers would look up information online about how to do better agriculture. They thought maybe their kids could get or a better education through distance education. They thought you know some of the um, villages would get better healthcare information, eBay. and all of these things would help. Right, exactly. Um, and when we got there uh, a couple of years after they had started, we found the computers in this kind of condition, oh, wow. uh, yeah. which is to say they were in yeah. very bad condition. Amazingly, these things worked, mm -hmm. um, but uh, <laughs> but the maintenance costs for maintaining the computers were so high that the co cooperative was thinking of shutting them down. And then not only that, we found that the villagers really just did not care about the internet. They didn't care about this information. A lot of it, of course, was linguistic. You know, they spoke Marathi, and most of the internet is still in English. So there was, you know, even agricultural information, you don't get a lot in the local languages. Um, the other side of it was, of course, that the farmers were not particularly educated. So it wasn't as if, even if you gave them, you know, um, papers about agronomy and agricultural techniques, that they were going to be able to absorb that information and really make use of it. Um, so, uh, but we did find that what the farmers really wanted most from these kiosks was that they used it as an information center for uh, getting contact with the sugarcane processing center, which was... Uh, I think about 40 kilometers away in most cases. And so, you know, every time what they would do is if they had a harvest, you know, these trucks would come by, haul off their goods. But then in the old system before these uh, computers, they would not hear back about how much uh, their harvest weighed, how much they were paid for, how much money they actually received until months later. And this system of kiosks basically allowed them to get that information within weeks, if not soon. Um, but the cooperative, again, was thinking of shutting them down because they thought, you know, we're, it's too expensive to keep up. So uh, just around that time, um, mobile phones, of course, were appearing on the scene, and we thought, hey, what if we just, you know, since they're not using the internet anyway, let's just give them, you know, these very inexpensive mobile phones and let them interact with the processing center uh, through, um, you know, the mobile phone network and just get the information via text message. And we implemented this, in, we piloted it in seven villages. Uh, it worked great. The farmers loved it. You know, many of the farmers didn't even come to the kiosk anymore because they had their own phones. Um, and, you know, some of them would, like, wake up, you know, whenever they wake up, which is like 3 a.m. in the morning, and, you know, query the system to see what was going on. Um, we found, you know, the farmers using them in all kinds of places, like out on the streets, in tea stalls, uh, on, in their fields. And in general, they were like, this is a great system, you know, we really don't need the computers if we can use it uh, through the phone. 
Um, we also co computed that you know, this system was much cheaper to keep up because it basically just required a database at the processing center and some occasional you know, phone charges, whereas the old system required this network of computers. So it seemed like it was a great idea. The farmers liked it, it worked better, it was faster, it was cheaper. Um, but then when we tried to roll it out to the uh, 45 or so other villages, we ran into some kind of political issue within the organization. Um, we worked primarily with the IT staff, and they were, of course, very happy to do, uh, to do this project. But somewhere higher up in the chain of command that we didn't quite um, uh, get a sense for, there was some resistance to this. And we have a feeling that it was some kind of internal political rivalry. And, um, and so, over the course of a little over five years, I probably uh, was involved in, I think, a little over 50 different projects um, in agriculture, in healthcare, in, um, in education, in governance, um, all kinds of different areas using everything from PCs to the internet to mobile phone to uh, custom hardware we built ourselves. And in every case, what we found was that lots of things uh, would work in research pilots, but then when we tried to roll them out, we would run into some kind of problem with usually the human institutions that we were, you know, that we were partnering with. Uh, sometimes it was political problems, sometimes it was the fact that people couldn't uh, make use of the technology the way that we thought uh, they would uh, make use of it. Sometimes it was you know, just lack of budget and resources. Um, sometimes it was lack of good leadership and management. Um, and you know, I saw this so many times that I, if I if finally I started asking myself, you know, why why does this happen? And uh, the conclusion I came to was that for the most part, <coughs> technology amplifies underlying human forces. So that means that wherever those human forces are well intentioned and positively capable, you can add technology and things will usually get better. Uh, and that's often the situation that we find ourselves in our own lives, right? Like you know, we can make use of technology, but we, we're doing that on the basis of a lot of education. Uh, you know, we have a certain amount of uh, income, we have social connections to people who can help us and so on. Um, but where the human forces are either negative, corrupt, dysfunctional, uh, any of those things, then no amount of good technology turns those things around. And it's not a question of technology design as much as that ultimately human beings control what the technology ends up doing. And somebody's invested in the system. Somebody's invested exactly in the system. The way exactly. It is. So that's right. And this seems like a very simple idea, but it leads to um, kind of corollaries that uh, are a little bit harder to digest. Um, and so I'm going to try to walk you through some of these ideas. Uh, so I'll ask you a few questions. So imagine you're the CEO for, of a for-profit company, and you have a good product, but for whatever reason, your sales team is not um, uh, turning a profit. Uh, which of the following do you think is most likely to improve the situation? Okay, so I'm going to ask you to pick one. Okay? Create a new strategy, replace the leadership team, provide more training to sales staff, or buy iPads for all the employees. <laughs> I say leadership team. Yeah. Right. So, so B. well, you know, most of you laughed at I D. Say create a new strategy. Well, because D describes what we've done with education. So exactly. That's right. All that's right. That's what we do. It does That's what we do. That's right. So, you know, I don't know if it's going to be A, B, or C. It'll depend a lot on the context, yeah. and there might be other things you do. But nobody generally thinks that D is going to do anything. But that's and yet, as you mentioned, that's our philosophy of how we're going to change the educational system in this country. Um, and it's true many other ways. And it, of course, it doesn't matter if you upgrade the data center or if you give employees productivity software. It's not about the technology and such. And interestingly, you know, um, I have a lot of uh, friends and colleagues in Silicon Valley uh, who are either venture capitalists or you know, themselves CEOs. And they get this for their own companies very well. But then they'll turn around and sell the technology to schools as if that's the right. key thing that changes yes. their that changes their um, uh, because their they have something to gain by doing that. They have something to gain, but they're also kind of you know they kind of completely it's bought into their own mythology of what the yeah. technology does. Mm -hmm. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Well, if you're the CEO and the answer is D, the answer is you should be replaced. <laughs> that might also be true. Can't be right. Yeah. Yeah. Be. All right. Um, so you know, as people have mentioned in education, this is one of the solutions. So I, at one point, uh, uh, volunteered for a nonprofit um, organization in the Seattle area, which uh, basically was trying to teach third through fifth graders uh, computer literacy skills. And these were kids who were from you know less privileged backgrounds, so they didn't get access to the computers as much in school. Um, and what I found was the most difficult thing about teaching these kids about technology was the technology. 
right? You know, every time I turned my back, this is what they would do. They would like find games. I mean, from all kinds of weird nooks and crannies online and on the computer. You know, sometimes I thought, okay, there's no way they can find a game on this computer. I turned off the internet. You know, the computer is clean of all the games, and somehow they would still find the games. Um, so, you know, I think kids are naturally curious, and that's one of the things that people bring up all the time when they talk about technology for kids, which is that, you know, they can teach themselves. But I think of it as, as the technology as kind of being, it's like a smorgasbord, you know, of, for the mind, right? It can give you good nutrition, but it also has all the desserts. And you would never send your five-year-old kid to the buffet dinner and say, look, you eat whatever the heck you want. Um, you know, about guidance, that doesn't work. Well, similarly, you know, these powerful technologies, if you offer the whole sports board at the same time, then the kids will tend to eat the dessert, the cognitive candy, rather than the broccoli. And, of course, that's not good for their uh, cognitive development. All right, next question. So, in which of the following countries is democratic free speech most available online? Okay, so you get to pick one of these. Uh, A. North Korea? No. No. B, China? No. Yes. C, Russia? Yes. No. D, the United yes. States? Yeah. yeah, so all the common sense answer is the United States. Now, the interesting thing is, you know, my guess is you may have heard a little bit about China and Russia, but you probably don't know too much about the internet in North Korea. Mm -hmm. But somehow you know that things are not going to work out there either. And that is actually correct. In North Korea, interestingly, they have built their own completely isolated internet which uses the same internet protocols that the rest of the world uses, but it's completely disconnected from the rest of the world's internet. Um, a few government officials get to surf online outside of the country, but everybody else only sees this North Korean internet. And you can be pretty sure that nobody on that North Korean internet is criticizing the Supreme Leader. Right? So, um, I, love, I love this picture. Like, you can see like this guy's like, oh yeah, I get to sit in this I'm going to see the other angle, because I just the same game that the kids um, so this is just to say that, again, you know, the technology, it's not that, you know, we often hear that the technology democratizes things or that it brings about, you know, better government uh, accountability, but it's not so much that the technology does that in and of itself, it's that the technology amplifies what's already there. So in the United States, we have free speech offline, and that's the reason why we have even more free speech online. Uh, you go to North Korea, there's no more free speech there online than there is offline. Uh, in China, interestingly, you know, they, uh, they allow a certain amount of speech online, but they have an army of censors. Um, it's something like 300,000 people involved in censoring social media on an ongoing basis. Uh, there, are, um, there are political scientists who have done studies where uh, they basically are trying to understand you know, how quickly things get censored. They find that within 24 hours of something objectionable being posted, it disappears. Um, so it's, this is a massive censorship machine, and it's, a, it's different from the Chinese, I mean, the North Korean way of dealing with it, but it reflects kind of China's, you know, political philosophy. Just a little bit. Just a little bit, exactly. And then in Russia, what's interesting is there, you know, people can pretty much post what they want, but the government uh, hires an army of trolls to basically post misinformation, right? So these people pretend to be regular people, but they effectively are spewing government propaganda. Which is again different from the North Korean model and the Chinese model, but it is very Russian in conception. Um, and so what you see in all these cases is that you know there's no such thing as the internet. The internet is there's an internet in America and there's an internet in North Korea and there's an internet in China. And in each case, the technology kind of reflects and amplifies the underlying political situation, um, not uh, not making things democratic in and of itself. All right, here's another question. So which of the following groups most often completes massive open online courses? Uh, a, jobless high school dropouts, B, motivated working class women, C, college educated professionals. C. 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 Yeah, that is in fact correct. Um, interestingly, several years ago when these MOOCs were really uh, just getting started, they made this big deal about how they were now making college education available to everyone, right? And sure. that it was going to be free. And so now yeah. we no longer have to worry about paying, you know, ridiculous tuition for college and even very, uh, kids from very poor families would be able to get a college degree. Uh -huh. Um, the data is in, and many from these, you know, from the MOOCs themselves, and basically C is the uh, correct answer. Um, and if you think a little bit about it, you can understand why. Um, basically, you know, it takes a lot of effort to learn things, even if the online versions are a little bit more, you know, easy to digest than textbooks. Yeah. So I was just going to talk about the, the idea of the content being a little bit harder for high school dropouts, and so it's frustrating them. You need, like, the Bill and Ted's excellent... Um, your college course, it's, right? It's possible that's a question of content, but um, a lot of it is that I think we tend to think of education as being about the content, but it's really about the motivation, 
right? Like, you I know, learning. It's, about the economics too. it's also certainly so about the economics. Because they, they can, the colleges can then teach that course to a thousand students with one professor and an assistant, whereas before they'd have to have four, four professors and four assistants. Well, so now they're saving a bunch of money, but they're still charging those college students the same amount. Right, so, so college, college students have four years of learning and practice taking college courses. <laughs> yes. So it takes a lot of money to get four years of training, so you can then complete a bunch so of books. you can do this on your own, exactly. <laughs> yes, in the back. Uh, I've also dealt with uh, trying to help people in the A and B categories. Another thing I've seen is most of the MOOCs that are out there right now, despite the best efforts, they usually have uh, points where things are not uh, perfectly clear. Sure. And the category C generally has other people around. They can ask yes. questions. Yeah. Oh, that's the problem, and they go on. That's right. I've unfortunately yeah, uh, in that large it. number of A and B, they hit that point. Yeah, There's nobody to ask. Class. They're frustrated, Ooh. and they're no, stuck. No, you're right. It's complete. Um, that's right, and you know, so I think you're saying that, well, why don't they just check on Google? But you know, the, one of the things that people who use Google don't realize is just how much brain capacity you need to use Google effectively, yes. yeah. right? So you need to know, you know, how, you have to be smart about the kind of keywords you use. You have to be smart about, okay, is this a trustworthy site versus this one? Um, you know, one of the challenges with a lot of technology being in education these days is that the kids you know, know how to get on Google, but they're not necessarily learning how to distinguish between reliable sources of information and not. Yeah. And those things, again, require, you know, it's like, basically the problem with these ideas is that you need the education first to be able to take advantage of the yeah. free education. I gotta tell you, though, no. I went to YouTube and it showed me how to switch my headlight. <laughs> it's all there. It is all there. The information is out there. The information is yeah. out there, yes. But there's a, a social factor here as well. If you take a look at Category B, motivated working class women, the first thing I start thinking of is, okay, I've got a full-time job yes. and a family, That's right. and I do all the housework because my husband doesn't do any of that stuff, and where do you, and after all of those things, that's right, where do you have the you time? Know, That's I'm, right. I'm sleeping so, four hours a night. Most of these people, as busy as they are, have the leisure time to be able to go home and, and not feel like they're so completely drained from their two jobs yes, yeah. that they can then as a hobby, learn something else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do people have any sense on what degree uh, categories A and B are being positively affected? Uh, it's a very small, extremely small minority. Um, the one place where you know this kind of social economic situation is upended through MOOCs is that if you're a very motivated, reasonably educated person in the developing world, you now have access to a much better education than you might have before. But um, that's a trend that's happening even independent of in technology, which is to say through you know, globalization, you know, many of the best educated people in every country are gradually you know, being able to be matched to the best jobs in the world. Yeah. One other question. On uh, that MOOCs for uh, Category C, does that include uh, those that are required uh, to be taken as part of the job, which uh, most, uh, most companies I know now, they require they say, oh, we don't have, we can't pay to have somebody teach this course. So instead, we just put online everybody's supposed yeah, to. Yeah, so in service, it turns out that many of these people are, are, are looking for ways to somehow enhance, you know, uh, their prospects at their own, the job they already have. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, they have, you know, the kind of basic education where they're confident that they can learn on their own. And they have, as other people have mentioned, various other resources mm -hmm. and advantages that allow them to do so. I, I met the ones like uh, a company might have a uh, uh, international trade policy or um, um, uh, financial uh, records keeping policies. They don't uh, teach it. There's no book on it. But they, they force the people to go to MOOCs. You go to the MOOCs, yes. Well, and that's, that's certainly that, believable. I know that occupies a significant percentage of the MOOCs I know are taken on the order of about uh, 50 to 70%. Uh, that might be true. I'm not sure if that's true in the general case, but uh, certainly don't, there are numbers like that. Um, so, you know, back to the thesis. Basically, well, I think all of this shows that, for the most part, technology amplifies underlying human forces. It doesn't, you know, so the, so the myth that I'm trying to argue against by suggesting this very simple idea, which, by the way, has been around but never been kind of formalized, is that, is that the alternative thesis is that technology is a net positive addition wherever it goes. Right? And that's the myth. Whereas what I'm suggesting is that technology is kind of neutral with respect to whether it's good, bad, or, uh, or not. Um, but it amplifies whatever social forces are already there. So 
What that means is, for example, technology by itself doesn't fix dysfunctional institutions. It's not going to turn around a for-profit company uh, in and of itself. And similarly, it's not going to turn around our educational system if we don't fix our educational institutions. In fact, it could even make it worse. It could make it worse, exactly. Um, technology by itself doesn't improve governance or make things more democratic. Again, if there are social forces in place that are tending towards that direction, then technology can help. Um, but if uh, those forces are not existent, then it doesn't make a difference how much technology there is. And China is a great example. Uh, that country has more than a billion uh, mobile phone owners, and more than I think 700 million people are connected to the internet. But you know, we're not seeing you know a Chinese revolution yet. Uh, that probably will not happen until economic conditions um, really get bad. Um, and finally, technology by itself does not shrink inequality, even though this is exactly the kind of rhetoric you hear out of Silicon Valley. Uh, in fact, if you believe that technology amplifies the underlying human situation, you might even expect that technology worsens uh, inequality. And that, that's happening too. And that might be happening too. Uh, well, so do you have any idea, I'm, so I'm, I'm wondering what the poverty level, if that's an absolute poverty level, or is, is that poverty level jumping up as, as people are getting better Quality, homes, That's a great better question. quality. So, mm -hmm. this is a graph from the U.S. Census Bureau, and um, every once in a while they rejigger how they, you know, measure poverty and so on. But it's meant to be, uh, it's meant to correlate with a standard of living that would allow somebody to have, you know, a reasonable, you know, life without being suffering from hunger, without suffering from uh, homelessness, and oh, so on and so okay, forth. Okay, I guess the question to extend it just for a moment is, sure. you know, so back in the, you know. 1930s or something, a rural person might not have indoor plumbing, right. might not have electricity, yes. that type of thing, and that's just taken as any anyone in an inner city that's poor would, would have that type of technology. No, you're absolutely right. So especially in a U.S. Uh, or developed world context, you're right that you know the fact that we now have these you know infrastructure, you know this infrastructure in place has certainly helped raise the standard of living for you know almost the entire population. Um, but what I'm suggesting is that on a relative scale, that's not true even in the developed world, and then if you include the whole, you know, developing world overall, then you find that you know there are still <coughs> three billion people in the world who don't have indoor plumbing, who don't have reliable electricity, and so on. Um, so the fact that the technology exists isn't by itself enough to ensure that everybody gets it. Uh, so, you know, one reason why I like to show this graph is basically we've seen a situation where since about the 19, you know, since about 1970, we have not seen a dramatic change in the rate of poverty, and we also, know, it's not on this graph, but we also know that the rate of uh, inequality has increased. Well, since that same period of time, we have seen all of these amazing digital innovations, right? So if you believe any version of the story that the invention of technology and the dissemination of technology and the spread of technology in and of itself changes things like the poverty rate or the rate of inequality for the better, then the juxtaposition of these two things suggests that that story is missing something, right? It casts doubt on this idea. Um, you know, sometimes I, you know, people say, well, you know, you don't know. Maybe if it wasn't for the technology, things would be worse. And I completely agree that that's a possible scenario. Mm -hmm. But if that's true, then the last thing we should be doing is trying to build more technology to fix that problem. We should be fixing the, the home mm -hmm. in the hall first, mm -hmm. which is a social, political, cultural issue, rather than trying to chase after this ridiculously terrible problem by you know, uh, out innovating it. Um, so one way or the other, uh, this idea that technology is going to, you know, save us from our persistent social problems is flawed. Yeah, just a question on, sure. the, on the graph there. Yeah, the absolutely. Graph. You're not showing anything causing the drop from 25% or 22% down to like 12% between 59 and 1968. Yeah, it's it's post World War II. I mean, there's lots of you know, like the transportation system got much better. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, so yeah. th there is technology in there. Oh, definitely, I completely agree. I mean, so one thing I should mention is that you know, at least to the extent that I'm talking about these things, I'm talking about digital technology, but. Um, but I do think these things also hold with uh, with other technologies, and you know the, the you know I've talked to a lot of people um, about what caused the drop in poverty from 1940s to 1970, and the predominant um, consensus among political scientists and economists is there was you know it was basically the New Deal, right? Yeah. There were yeah. there was very progressive rate of taxation. There were constant efforts by the federal government to build out infrastructure, which on the one hand built infrastructure, but also provided jobs for millions of Polio people. Polio vaccine. There were strong unions in place. Um, yeah. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. All these things that we are kind of, we have been eroding slowly but surely since the 1970s. You know, one thing I want to make sure is that I'm not suggesting that the technology is the cause of cause of the flatlining. It's just that it's not enough to to make things better. Um, so, uh, if you believe this thesis that technology amplifies underlying human forces, then the question is, you know, what is the critical thing that we should be working on? Given that we seem to have a lot human of human forces, of course. human forces, exactly. Focusing on the right human forces. So let's go back to this world, right? The economics of the future are somewhat different. Um, so uh, 